Well, welcome to today's Awesome Marriage Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, I hear so many parents struggling with what do we do about screens and our kids? When do we give our kids a phone? When and how and all those kind of questions that come along with this technology that has caught all of us kind of by surprise. So many things have happened in such a short period of time. Well, today on the podcast, Arlene Pelican joins me. She is a marriage and family speaker. She's the host of the Happy Home Podcast. She's the author of so many books, including Screen Kids. I'm excited. You're going to love this podcast. It's going to give you some real practical things that you can do to help your kids and your family when it comes to screens and your marriage. So we're delighted to have her joining us today. Let's go to the studio right now. Arlene, welcome to the Awesome Mary Podcast. Uh, thank you so much for agreeing to meet with me today and have a good conversation. And so excited to have you and just so, so impressed and excited about all the stuff that you do and how much you help people. Oh, that's very kind of you. It's an honor for me to be with you, Dr. Kim. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I know we're going to have some fun. So let's talk about, let's just kind of jump into the stats about the state of marriage today in our culture yeah. and how it is affecting, affecting that younger generation. Yeah. You know, I was very surprised to read some statistics. We kind of know that, okay, people are not getting as married as much as they used to, or, you mm -hmm. know, people don't think of marriage as highly or as, you know, like an important milestone as they used to. So 81% of the silent generation got married. 61% of the boomers got married, 53% of the Gen Xers, that's my generation, got married. And so you can see the numbers are going down, right? 53, but 44% of the millennials. So you compare 81% of the silent wow. generation to 44% of millennials. So you see that, wow, like, with every generation, less of us are getting married. And I think many times people think, well, if I get married, what's the point? Because it's probably going to end in divorce anyway. So maybe I should save mm. myself. But the divorce rate is actually down. So compared to, you know, three decades ago, we have less divorces, but we also have less marriages. So there is that correlation there. Sure. So it's not necessarily fair to say. But among churchgoers, so people who don't just go on Christmas and Easter, but people who are, you know, like we're committed to our faith. We actively mm -hmm. are part of a church. You know, this is part of our lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. We read the Bible. We believe the Bible, all those things. Then you see, you know, 70% of those couples staying together. And I think that, you know, yes, that's 30% that are divorcing and that is, that is hard and that is sad, but it's also, wait, seven out of 10 are going to make it. That's not too bad, right? Of a number. Right. And they right. even had this statistic that if you prayed together every day, so every day you're having a prayer together, that only 1% of couples divorced. And that wow. was a study out of the University of Texas in San Antonio. So I think if people really are very committed to Christ, they are committed to some very basic principles of being decent to one another and, and kind to one another, all those things that the, the possibility. Now, here's some statistics that will blow your mind the opposite way. We are really into happiness right now. So Brad Wilcox mm -hmm. uh, out of the University of Virginia has all this marriage research. And what he found was what brings people happiness? Because that's what everyone, the younger people, everyone's looking for. Well, this doesn't make me happy anymore. What's going to make me happy? So they found having a college degree gave you a 64% boost in happiness. You know, and we're all about like get that right degree, et cetera. Having a higher income than most gave you an 88% boost. Being satisfied with your work, saying, I find it meaningful, I like it, it's fulfilling, 145% boost. So this is good. You're, so you're like, wow. wow, if you go to college, you make some money, you're happy with your work. But if you're just married, plain married, you get a 151% boost, even more than being wow. satisfied at work. And if you're happily married, so if you've got an awesome marriage, like your podcast, if you've got an awesome marriage, a very happy marriage, you get a 545% boost in your happiness. And so really those who are able to make the commitment to marriage, that they can make it work and that they can go into the decades of their life with their best friend at their side, they are the happiest people on earth because they have people around them. They, they're not suffering from this epidemic of loneliness. And these are really, really good reasons for young people to reconsider like, oh, I was told being having a college degree is what made you happy. And yet, it, wow, if you have a good marriage, a good relationship, that's going to boost it, you know, like exponentially more. You know, nobody's told me that. So I'm so glad yeah, that we're right. able to talk about this. Absolutely. So when we, we talk about the difference between the different generations from silent down to the millennials, um, it, 
my guess is that the millennials, a lot of them grew, grew up in broken homes Yeah, because they probably grew up in that time when you were talking about when the stats on, on divorce were, were pretty high. Do you feel like that has, has that been part of the influence, what they had, what they saw in their homes growing up? I think so. You know, and then that is the responsibility of us who are married. How can we, you know, work on our marriages and do things in our marriages so that the children that come after us, um, whether they're our own children or nieces and nephews and people watching us, that they'll right. say, oh, I, I want that. Like, I would like what these people have for us to have that model of marriage. But yes, I think that a, a bunch of things, right? So that, oh, the parents are divorcing and then maybe the taboos being, being uh, it's not t- taboo, you know, to live with someone anymore where before it'd be like, oh, well, if mm-hmm. you're going to live together, you better, you have to get married, you know? So those right. kinds of things have, have lent to that, I think. Absolutely. If I, Nancy and I had lived together before we got married, her dad would have killed me. Right, I mean, exactly. Just, you you no wouldn't doubt. have made it. There's just no doubt. <laughs> no, he, would just, he would have dragged me out of where we were living and, <laughs> exactly. and he wouldn't have cared. So, but, uh, but those constraints aren't there yes. in, in most places now. Yeah. Still some, but but not there as much. So, yeah, I love the deal of the happiness and and how that escalates all the way up to being a happy marriage. And I love that you said I'd heard before to the the stat on prayer and marriage. And I think that's one of the things that we did right, Nancy. Yeah, uh, I told her before was mentored by a lady before we got married, and and she said the one thing you do is you guys pray together every day. Mm-hmm. And I wish I could say that it was my idea. It wasn't. But we did. And yeah. I think it made a difference. Even then when we, I didn't even know what we were doing and praying. But yeah. God, I think, just wants to be in the middle of a relationship, of a marriage relationship. And he honors that. He, yeah. I think he honored our faithfulness to that as we were growing to understand what that really meant. It's hard to be, so, yeah. you know, mad at someone that you're praying with, you know, and, oh you're, and you're more compassionate towards the other person when you hear kind of like what's on their heart and what they're talking to God about, then you feel like, oh, you know, so all those things. It is. And I, I think it absolutely, you know, there, there were a few times when, because we always would hold hands and pray. And if we were mad at each other, we'd still pray, but we didn't always hold hands, you know. It right. Was like, <laughs> exactly. Get, I'll hold your hand tomorrow. Over just to, yeah, yeah. Yeah, get over a little bit. I'm not quite over this yet. <laughs> that's right. But, but I think that's encouraging. And I think it's encouraging for those who are believers to know that I think it just shows how much God does care for marriage. Yeah. And that he, if we seek him and his guidance in that, that usually he's going to have an answer for us. There's for always sure. going to be an answer to the things that we go through. Yeah. And, and, and I think we just get, people get scared by what they hear. And, you know, like if they grew up in a home where maybe they never saw marriage modeled well. I love what you said about all of us being a model, though, because I think we don't realize sometimes we have that opportunity to touch people outside of our home. Yeah. As they, whether they're family members or just friends, kids, or those things that were the people to look at our marriages and say, Wow, that looks like they're doing pretty well there. They yeah, seem that looks pretty almost fun. Happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. Looks yeah. Like it's it's good. like that. Yes. Exactly. So let's kind of get into technology. You've certainly written a lot on that, how it's affecting relationships. What moved you moved you to action on this topic? I think you just have to look around, right? And you're like, what's happening yep. in the restaurants? Why are people all looking yes. at their devices? Or you look at, at people in transit and everybody's looking at their phone. Or you look at a family in a car and everybody's watching a movie. And then you go into your own house or you visit someone else's house. And it's like, oh, everybody is doing their own thing. Where it used to be, you know, the television, people will say, well, you know, the the internet and mobile devices, it's just kind of like the television of old. But it's it's really not. Because the television of old, was stationary. It was huge. You didn't put it in your pocket and walk around with it. (laughs) And everybody had to agree like on what to watch because there was just one of them, you know, or, you know, and obviously there'll be more televisions, et cetera. But just think of that in a family, you had to decide what can sister watch, what can brother watch, what can mom not be too terribly bored with, you know, like we had to decide as a team what to watch. And it was something that brought us together. But as technology has become cheaper, faster, um, more socially engaging, uh, things like that. And by socially engaging, I mean, instead of you and me connecting, I'm just broadcasting my pictures to the world, you know, in social media, hoping that somebody's going to notice. So this is not an advance. 
So as this has become more normal, then the family, it's like, oh, we have no patience to watch something that we don't want to watch. So it's mm. like the husband, I'm going to watch sports and the wife, well, I'm going to watch HDTV and the kid, I'm going to play my video game and the other kid, well, I'm going to, you know, play this different video game. And another kid, I'm just going to be on Netflix and everyone is alone in the same house under the same roof. And we are physically sharing space together, but we are emotionally far away from each other. And then spiritually too, you know, can the screen bring you closer to God? Of course it can. I call these digital vegetables. Like you could be learning a language on, you know, uh, on YouTube so that you can go on a mission trip. You could be listening to sure. a sermon. You could be doing all of these things, but you ask any adult or child in the room, hey, what are you doing right now? They're probably not saying, oh, I'm FaceTiming a missionary or I am memorizing Deuteronomy <laughs> using this cool app. Like nobody is using it for this. So for us to realize these things can be used to, and that's a question, like is our technology and our marriage, are we using it to bring us together? Are we using mm. it in our family with our kids? Is technology bringing us closer together? Because it can. Like if you're just using it to FaceTime grandma in a different state, that, I mean, that's the beauty Absolutely. of the technology. That's amazing. But if you're using it so that you can watch four hours of shows every night instead of talking to your parents, that's probably not a good use of technology. So that question of is technology bringing you closer together or causing you to go further apart you know, it's a good question because it used to be in the small moments of the day, the red lights, the lines, the meal times. These were like the little moments to be like, hey, how are you doing? What's going on with mm -hmm. you that you would check in with your spouse or check in with your kid? Hey, tell me about, a, you know, what happened today? But what happens in all those little moments waiting in line, sitting in the house, sitting in the car? We got our phones and, and we're missing all these little times to connect. And that's why we do feel disconnected. You're not feeling as close to your spouse. You don't feel as close to your kids because these moments of connections have been lost. And it's, it's, yeah. it's bad. It's really, really bad because you see kids are getting the devices younger and younger because mom or dad, we're tired of saying like, you know, borrow my device, borrow my device. And then you're like, oh, right. let me just get you your own. So now, I mean, you're going to be shocked, Dr. Kim, half of two to four year old kids have their own tablet or smartphone in America, half of them. And wow. two thirds of five to eight year olds have their own tablet uh, so that they don't have to mess, you know, with their parents anymore. But you know what this means is if the younger we are and we're used to all our companionship being with the screen, then as they get older, you know, there's a lot that's going to be missing. That's going to be a lot more challenging to replace. Oh, I think so. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Those are uh, amazing statistics. Yeah. I, I knew, you know, just, just by visualizing things yes. you see a lot, but I, that's, that's, those are daunting statistics. Yeah. Def, definitely in that when we see that, when you see a family sitting around the table at a restaurant and everybody's on a device, you know, it, it just, I guess it makes me sad more than anything because mm -hmm. they're missing out on something. They're yeah. missing out on that chance to connect. And I have families that say, you know, that they'll admit what your description is pretty good. Everybody's on a different device at night. Uh, even some of them sit in the same room and do it, but they're, are you really connected if you're all on your same, because you're in, everybody's in their own little world, right? Yeah. And, and so you, I think we just miss out on so much. And I think, you know, what are we, what are our kids going to be like later if they've yeah. never had that interaction and that connection? I was thinking the other day I was at Starbucks and I was thinking, I remember the time when we stood in line at Starbucks and we talked to people. Yeah. And people would chat. And chatted, yes. And yeah. I, I had some great conversations there with people. And that didn't happen anymore. Yeah. You know, we our, our, I think our, our phones are our, our go to probably for avoidance because, you know, <laughs> and they're very you walk easy. Around. Yeah, they don't and expect very easy. Yeah, they don't expect anything from you. You don't have to be in a good mood no. to talk to it. <laughs> yes. 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 It it is. So let's you just kind of expand a little bit more, dig a little deeper on how technology has impacted marriages. Yeah. What have you seen in that area? You know, if someone, if you were like on a date and there was another person there, they'd be like, hey, why is this person here? It would be very obvious, like, this is the date between the two of us. But if you are on a date and both of them have their phone out, right, that's very common. But it's kind of the same. Like you have something distracting. You know, they've done studies, not of couples, but just of people and how they rate the quality of the interaction. And mm -hmm. if two strangers meet and there's no phones present, 
they'll talk about like, that was a nice meeting. You know, like I enjoyed meeting that person. But if the, the two people, strangers meet, but there's a phone on the table, what even not them not using the phone, but just the presence of the phone, the, the, this technoference, if you will, that just it being there makes them distracted enough to kind of wonder if my phone's going to ring. I, I kind of want to check it. So I'm kind of divided, distracted. And they will report that that was not as satisfying of an experience. Like, oh, the person wasn't a very good listener. I didn't really connect with this person. And you think about that in your marriage. Obviously, you chose your spouse because you found them wildly interesting at the time <laughs> that you thought like, right. this person is wonderful. <clears throat> like they have these wonderful traits. We like doing the same things. We have similar values. We find the same stuff funny. Like there was a lot of things that why you were attracted to your spouse. So there's obviously something there. But when we have these phones, they are so addictive and made to be addictive. That's what we have to realize that it's not just this neutral device yeah. that we're putting in our pocket, but that this is something that has been relentlessly tested to find out how can we keep your attention? How can we either make you so mad that you want to keep looking or how can we make you so sad or engage you so that, that and let's find exactly the topics you're interested in. We keep showing you that. Let's have you shop for mm -hmm. all the stuff that you love. Let's give you the politics you love. Let's give you the music music that you love. I mean, it's everything that you are looking for. It's all tailor made to keep your attention. And how in the world is a spouse of flesh and blood supposed to make all these algorithms all day in their mind and tell you exactly what you want to hear, <laughs> exactly when you yes. want to hear it and be a fountain of information and, and wit and have the entertainment to be able to rival YouTube? Like, how are they going to compete with that? So for us to realize, wait a minute, like we have this weapon of mass distraction, you know, in our pocket that's mm. really wired to keep us interested. And how is our poor spouse supposed to compete with that? And so whether it's date night, whether it's just the time after between work ending and going to sleep, uh, you know, any, any of that, any of those moments, like we need to realize we need to put the phones away so that and physically away, like if you find that even if it's just on your table or in your pocket, you keep looking at it or checking it, then you have to realize like, oh, my goodness, like I need to put it far away, mm -hmm. like maybe in the same place that you put your cups and your plates or something like just somewhere far away for the evening and and have that evening with your spouse so they don't have to constantly compete. Because I think it is just kind of go where your eyes go, you know, because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Right. I remember when James and I were first dating. So we're just dating and we're just staring into each other's eyes. And we can do this for hours, right? Because you're just dating. You're just looking at oh, each yeah. other the whole time. And he said to me one day, do you know what I see when I look in your eyes? I see the letters AV. Your contact lenses say AV. And I couldn't believe it, Dr. Kim. I went <laughs> home. I popped out the contact <laughs> lens. And indeed, they said AV. And he had oh, discovered something I didn't even know about myself that they said that. Because why? Because he's looking at me so intently. Oh, yeah. He notices these things. And it's the same with your spouse. Like, if you look at them, you're going to notice, like, oh, what is troubling my spouse? Oh, look, they really got a kick Absolutely. out of that. I, you know, you're looking at them. You're noticing but what are we doing? We are not noticing anything. <laughs> the only thing we're doing is right. responding to our notifications. We are trying to get our emails under control. We are trying to get caught up on our social media. We are texting back our mother who had just asked us a question. You know, we're doing mm. all these things. And so it really has diluted the time that we spend with our spouses because it gave us this huge competitor that's really hard to beat. Mm -hmm. And that you both kind of have to be on the same page of saying like, hey, we've been watching way too much sports or news or shopping or whatever it is. And, and we need to get back down to the basics and just take a walk after dinner together. It could be that simple yeah. of let's just take a walk after dinner together with no devices and slow down and just catch up. And that could be a very simple and and powerful way to combat this whole like I'm giving all my attention and affection to this device instead of giving it to you, this person in my real life. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's, it just starts somewhere. Yes, you know, I, I love yes. it because I, I just believe couples that, that take walks together, it, they, they connect. And yeah. I've talked to so many couples that, well, yeah, we connect better when we take walks. Maybe it's the way God wired us. I don't know, but, yeah. but there's something about that. But if we're, if you're both looking on your phone, for one, you may run into something and two, you're not going to connect. That's right. So it's not, it's not really good. And I think so many things have become normal for us yes. that we don't even realize that I I've had, 
I don't know how many times I can tell you that I've had a couple in counseling and one of them phone does something and the person picks it up yeah. right in the middle of counseling. Right. And I never say anything because I don't have to. This other spouse is usually the one that says something, you know, like that's what I've been talking about or something like right. that. But I think, <laughs> yes. but I think it's so normal that you, you're sitting there, you're, yeah. you're trying to make your marriage better and you're sitting there with a counselor, you're paying for the time and you pick up your phone yeah. and it's like, we just don't even think about it. So I love the idea of get them as far away from us as you can. And it you shows know, couple, you what, it shows you how normal it is. You know, I hear people too, like yes. in the business meetings. And then after 15 minutes, people just pull out their phones or the same idea of you paid for a really expensive dinner, like enjoy it. Don't just like sit on your phone. You might as well have just eaten fast food together, you know? So right. I love this idea of leveraging the money. Like if you've spent money for it, it seems like you should really pay attention to it. That could be a, a basis. And just realizing that if I want to get value out of this, I better put down my phone. And if I can't put down my phone, that, that must be a little bit of a warning then sign for me it should be kind of a yeah. red flag yeah also because i think it's yeah I and mean, i've you know i i'm not judging people because i can fall yeah. in the same traps and i have and, and you know nancy and i realized that we always used to have great conversations as we were in the car and we started one of us being on the phone <laughs> and we said yeah, we're, i miss those times yeah. and so we don't get on phones when we're in the car but we had to be intentional about that because it was just kind of normal yes to begin looking at your phone when your spouse is right there, you're in a car, you have no distractions from kids or grandkids yeah. or anybody else that you can really have a conversation and enjoy I, each other. And I, I have a suggestion from a friend that I really liked. She found that it was very easy to lie in bed or lie on the couch and then just kind of mindlessly scroll on her phone. And I know a lot of people can identify with that. You're tired at the end of a long day, you're lying on the couch, yes. you're lying on the bed, you've got your phone in your hand and you're just scrolling through different things. And she realized that's how I waste my time. So I don't look at my phone when lying down. So whether, so, so if I want to look at it, she sits up, like she sits in a chair or stands up. So it eliminates her scrolling in bed and it eliminates her just scrolling in the couch, on the couch, you know, in the living room. And really just those simple kind of rules that really yeah. does help because then now, good, now it's not the last thing that you're looking at before you go to sleep. And it's not the thing you're just lounging around with it, sitting on the couch, lying on the couch they're looking at. Yeah. I have a family that came and granted, they all, at, at, whenever it's dinner time, everybody docks their phone in, in a different room, different yeah. place. And there's, I, I think it was like three hours. They have dinner at six. There's a three hour gap there. Nobody gets on their phone. That's awesome. And the dad who's in a business, he, I love it. He, he told people, he said, I'm not going to be available through those times. That's my yeah. family time. Nobody complained. Yeah. Nobody said, what do you mean? I can't get you at seven fifteen? No, nobody said anything. They, yeah. they respected that. And then yeah. he would check his phone before he went to bed and see if there's anything he need to do. But they, they just kept that time sacred for family backing to the things that we were talking about of sitting around the table eating dinner together yeah. and and just laughing together and you know kids say funny things and you don't want to miss that you know yeah. when they're telling you about something that happened at school today and and I think we just have to regain the, how valuable that is yes and that those years especially raising kids now that poor Nancy and I are that goes fast yeah it goes really fast and so I I don't want to miss anything. I you don't, don't want, want to miss, miss that anything. time with them because you don't get that back. Yeah. And you're not really building the, the relationship where your kids want to come home after they leave either. I mean, they probably will, but you know, yeah. they, what do they look forward to? Well, I do like that lounge chair dad's got that I can look at my phone not yet but other than that it's not going to be a big pull is it like oh I really want to go visit no. my mom and dad so I can sit and look at my phone on their couch it's like yeah, why exactly. come exactly <laughs> exactly and I think we I, I I thought probably the first 10 years after we had iPhones and I think it's probably still true some a lot of things that parents did and didn't do with their kids is because the parents had no idea how to handle yeah. phones. And I think we still don't in so many ways. It, it came, all that technology seemed to hit us pretty quickly. Yeah, and very got, quickly. And like you said, and then people figured out, oh, we can make people look longer by yeah. learning how to give them more of what they're interested in. 
And so then all of a sudden it's like we're we're in the middle of something that we are playing catch up on, really. Yes. Most yeah. of us. There is an amazing new book out by social scientist Jonathan Haidt, and it's called The Anxious Generation. And it's about the uh -huh. great rewiring of childhood. And really what what is fascinating is it wasn't the iPhone, because the first iPhone was like a Swiss army knife, like, oh, you can listen to music and you can call right. someone and you can use GPS. But it was when the iPhone became that they had the front facing camera that now you can take selfies of yourself mm -hmm. and that when they introduced the like button and the share button and that everything became not just like two bulletin boards that you share with a friend, but now you're broadcasting to the world that those two changes really messed up a lot of kids to then oh, be yeah. very focused on now it's all about showing myself to strangers and making myself impressive to all these people that I barely know instead of having a real life friendship with someone who know you know so the whole thing so really what the what they're suggesting now social scientists today so we as parents can take this warning is no smartphones until high school or later and no social media until 16 or later. So that is what they are now saying based on research. So now we're kind of at the stage of the game that, okay, now we kind of know more that this is yeah. very harmful. So as parents, you know, this is a call to, to protect our kids and that's going to help them. Guess what? If they're not addicted to social media or video games, guess what? They're attaching to you. And when they're adults, they come back, they're going to come back to hang out with you, not to hang out on the phone. <laughs> that's all. Those are yeah. all good things. Exactly. That's, that's really interesting. So uh, what would you say to someone yeah. that says, oh my gosh, we've blown it. Yes. We've got an eight-year-old with a phone. We've got a 10-year-old yeah. with a phone. And we've got a 12-year-old with a phone. What yeah. would you say to them? You, it is not too late. You are listening to this podcast for a reason. You are here. There is not condemnation. You don't have to go and like hide for two years because of what you didn't know. You just say, what, do I, what would be healthy for my kids moving forward? And many times, you know, Dr. Gary Chapman of the Five Love Languages mm. and I wrote Screen Kids. And that book, Screen Kids. And so let's say you didn't have the opportunity to know this information beforehand. So a lot of times it's an apology. Child of mine, I gave you this video game. I didn't realize how violent it was. I didn't realize how yeah. addictive it was. I didn't realize how angry it would make you. That's my fault because I'm your parent. It's my job to protect me. I know you're going to hate this. You might even hate me for a while. You might say I'm the meanest, yep. strictest parent of all time, <laughs> but we are going to take this back because it was our mistake to give it to you and we will keep it back indefinitely from you. And we do it because we love you. Now, so you're apologizing. You're not blaming the kid of saying, you're a bad kid and why are you on this right. so much? Why don't you see that this is bad and blah, blah, blah. So take, we take responsibility. It's our fault, whether it's we gave you a phone too soon, we let you on social media too soon, we let you play this video game, we really regret it now. Whatever it is, I'm sorry that I had done this. I didn't know as much or I was really afraid of making you mad. But I realize yeah. now that it's more important for me to protect you and I... I I will even handle you being mad at me, but just please know that I love you. So, you know, you're saying these things and maybe, and you have to have the expectation, like this is going to go really bad because of what parents will do is they'll think, oh, this will fix it. And then their kids mad at them. And then they give in day three and it's all, you're yes. back in the same spot. So you have to realize, okay, my kid's going to be really mad at me. Let's say for two weeks, my kids will be so mad at me for two weeks. Just have that expectation. But at the end of that time, your kid, you're going to be like, wow. My kid is acting so much more like they used to before they had this, you know, device that turned them into a monster, you know, and they're going to feel it too. Like, oh, I'm sleeping again. I'm not yeah. as like mood crazed anymore. I'm not, I'm not having this feeling, you know, so, so it's going to be good. But you as the parent, you have to prepare to be unpopular and be okay with that because that's, it's your job to protect your child. And then when your child is 18, 21, they're out of your house, you know, you can let them know you can be on social media all you want till your eyeballs fall out. But for me, when you are in my house, you know, I've learned some things and you might be 17 years old and now I'm going to collect the phone at night so you can have a good night's sleep. And this might be a battle, but I'm willing to fight it because I want your health. So the whole thing is I want your health, try to replace it with something good. So for instance, if they're used to gaming for three hours and all of a sudden it's gone, then, Hey, this is a time to realize, Oh, you love drawing or you love baseball or let's go mm. visit you know, um, national parks and, and make a big sure. trip of it, you know, whatever it is, like replace it with something healthy and that will strengthen your child and your family. 
Oh, yeah. That, that's so good. And I, I think it will be a fight. I've had yes. parents that yeah. I haven't had anybody that just did it long term, but I've had parents do it short term yeah. in, in trying to redefine some things for a couple of weeks. I've heard the words that you said, I have my child back from yeah. almost every one of mm-hmm. them. And I think the kids, sometimes they won't admit to the parents, but when they come in and talk to me, they go, yeah, it, is, it has been pretty nice yeah. because they're not caught up in who's doing what and all this yes. other thing and, and all that stuff that causes yes. oh yeah and causes anxiety and why wouldn't I have all that stuff that yeah. we see and uh, but I think you're right a parent you got if you're going to do it you got to be ready to follow through mm-hmm. and you got to be ready to take a few hits and you may even take some hits from their friend's parents or you know right. who knows yes but if that if you know that that's the right thing for your child yeah I don't think you'll ever regret doing it. You won't. I I will tell you, it can be hard in that short term, but the long term benefit is amazing. And, you know, our our kids' claim to fame is they didn't have video games and they didn't have social media because I had been doing this research and had been seeing like, oh, this is not good for you, kids. You know, so (laughs) here they are. They don't get their smartphone until their senior year in in high school. It's usually like my daughter's a senior and she's just about to get it in May. So they spend most of their high school experience without a smartphone, without social media, without video games. And you can ask any one of them. We We made a little free documentary people can watch. You can ask any one of them, are you sorry? And they'll say, oh, no, like we've lived free. We've had fun. We've learned things. We've done. We've had time for our hobbies. We had time for the things that are important to us. And they truly have loved it. And so I I can be a living testament of saying you can kind of let your kids in on it, like let them watch things like The Social Dilemma, which is the tech insiders kind of telling like how they baked the sauce, you know, like how they made it this way. And it gives your older children and teenagers the realization like, oh, wait a minute, I don't want to be like a sucker. Like I want to be smarter than that. And I want to take care of myself and let them own that. And when they do that, you're going to find, my goodness, your life becomes so easy because all of a sudden you're not struggling about, Mm. oh my goodness, how do I click this phone at 2 2 a.m.? Oh my word, they've seen pornography. What do I do? Oh my goodness, they're addicted to this video game and I can't get them to go to school. Like you avoid all those really, really pesky, terrible problems by saying one big no to a technology that is is very hard. Once you get it in, it's really hard to rein it in. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one thing that I was just thinking as you were talking about that, that a few of the things that we did, because smartphones weren't really around when our kids yeah. were in high yeah. school. They're kind of coming in, but it wasn't like everybody had one. Yeah. You know, usually back then, businessmen had them, um, people that, for different things. But there are other things that that we did that our kids were not happy about that we just felt was right and my son was probably I guess it was after he was married and we were sitting down one day and he said you know I've been mean to tell you thank you thank you for saying no thank you for doing the things that you did I was so mad at you back then and now as a parent Mm -hmm. I get it and and I'm so glad you did what you did and that was just so cool so that's really cool at some point they're going to figure it out they will and Mm -hmm. you know and they're going to realize what you did for them and hopefully they they pass it on and they do that for their kids and we start a trend maybe in the other direction you know and then the opposite can happen too that they say to the mom to the dad why did you let me do this like why did you let me ruin my life why did you let me squander my time my youth like why'd you let me do that and I think that fear also can drive us to be like oh I better make the right decision I better do right to my kid because I don't want that day to come when they're in their early 20s asking me those kinds of questions yeah well I think it's interesting with your daughter this uh, when they're 17 I would guess because she's older and mature that she sees what her friends and other people have done. And I think she has a different perspective on that and she can see the value in in what you guys did. Yeah. You can see like the time wasted. Time wasted is a huge one. And then just like the the mental health, just that, you know, why are they so anxious and so worried and things like that? Does she seem like, wow, I, 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 I have a clean slate, like I'm doing okay versus, oh my goodness, my friends have to have all these other things to worry about. Oh my gosh, yes. 
And the things that they can worry about is crazy. Yeah. Crazy. So let's back a little bit about for, for couples, any tech boundaries that you think just every couple should have? Yeah. I think the screen-free meal time is a big one. Now, obviously, if you yeah. need your phone because you have someone's getting picked up, you know, I get that. So it's not like you can't ever use it. But, you know, it's, if it doesn't have a specific purpose, then you never have it at mealtime. You don't use it on date nights except to snap a quick picture, get your directions, and then put it away. Yeah. I like to say it's like a hot potato. Like you just want to get it out, make it do its thing and then put it away as soon as possible so that it's not distracting to you. I think, you know, not, not having it be the last thing you go to sleep with and the first thing you wake up with, that's a good habit as a couple, whether that is that you are looking at each other or that you are, you know, I'm not necessarily a morning person, so I'm not looking at my husband staring him in the eyes in the morning, but it's good <laughs> to have, you know, be greeted by something else, you know, whether it's a cup yes. of coffee, the Bible, you know, just thinking silence, Absolutely. that's much better. So those kinds of things. And I think an openness, and believe me, I'm as guilty of this as anybody else that it's like, oh, I'll say this. And then I'll be like, I need to tell my husband this, <laughs> you know, for, for us yeah. is, is that openness to like, Hey, if you ever feel like I am on this too much, like, please let me know. So me, I will work at my desktop. It's not so much my phone, but because the nature of my work, mm -hmm. podcasting, writing, speaking, I can do it any time of the day. And so I'll just be on my computer all day. And then my husband will come home after dinner and be like, turn your computer off, you know? So it's, it's that awareness. So for some spouses, it's like, you know, please stop being on social media for others. It'll be like, okay, you've already seen a game. Do you need to watch like three more games? So have that conversation yes. with each other that it's okay just ask once in a while, am I using technology too much? Is there something that I could kind of change? Is there some place where you feel left out or that you feel like kind of your second place? Because it's, mm. you know, just be open to that. Most of us will never Absolutely. have this conversation because we don't want to hear the answer because then we have to be like, oh, shoot, I can't watch my favorite show or, oh, I really, you know, plus we ourselves are happy with how we're using our technology because if my husband asks me to change something, I might ask him to change something. And we, you know what I mean? mean like we just kind of avoid yeah. it because we don't want to have to change our our ways so i think making it something that's okay to talk about and then yes. responding to your spouse when they do say hey i really wish you wouldn't look at the phone while we're talking right so if your spouse says that and then take it like respond to it instead of being like okay i'll try and then not doing it at all no really like be very conscious the next 10 times you talk to your spouse that you just Put that phone away and don't touch it. Like be very responsive to it. And I think you'll see then with those small wins, then you'll get like, okay, we're, we're getting in a better rhythm again. And if you find like, wow, this really is a problem for us, which would not be weird. It's a problem for like most people. Oh, yeah. Maybe it's a digital Sabbath where you say, you know, on Friday nights, we don't go online unless we're watching something together. Or maybe it's like a certain day, like on Sundays that you say, okay, we'll, we'll not go on YouTube. We'll not go on social media. We won't buy anything on Amazon. Like Sundays yeah. are day off and both do that. Like you can have rhythms that will check you to make sure you're not overusing it. And, you know, if you have no problem skipping it, then you know, like, oh, this is fine. But if it's like, oh my yeah. word, you know, I went all Sunday without looking at Amazon, <laughs> then you know, like, oh, okay, you might have a little bit of a problem. <laughs> I have a little bit of a shopping problem there. Uh, you know? So I think those kinds of things absolutely. are helpful. Yeah, the Amazon driver is going to be mad at me. I, That's right. He doesn't have anything to de <laughs> deliver to He didn't come. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I, I think that's, and I think the whole idea of getting on the same team with it, of, yeah. of just agreeing together that our, our marriage, I mean, the most important person in this world next to your relationship with Christ is, is your spouse. Yeah. And why would you trade your spouse? I mean, if you put it just practically, why would you trade your spouse for 30 minutes on scrolling something? I yeah. mean, it just doesn't even make sense. And so yeah. I think when you decide together, we're going to do everything to make our marriage better. That doesn't mean you have to totally cut it out, but put some parameters around it, put some boundaries around it. Yeah. And, and where you've got control of it instead of it having control of you. And I Very think that's so. where we most get in problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. That's so good. Okay. What about, let's go with kids and talk about some good practices for them Yes. that the parent as parents or even grandparents, because, you know, like our grandkids spend and have spent a lot of time yeah. at our house because we live close. So what about with kids? What are some best practices in those areas? Yeah, we've kind of touched on them. If you have young kids and you have not given them devices yet, personal right. devices, then the 
if you do this, you will be so golden and you will, you'll come back and you'll be like, oh, I'm so glad I listened to that lady, Arlene. She sounded so crazy at the moment. But if you will wait till they are in high school to give a phone, a smartphone. So Bill Gates, he didn't give his kids phones until they were in high school. So if you have young kids and you make that decision, you will be against the stream, but you're going to just love that decision. So do that. And the same thing with social media, 16 years or older, you don't have to do it at 16 or older. See it like driving. You don't just give a kid like, hey, here's some keys. Good luck with it. Yeah. You have to like test, like, are they a responsible person? If your child is not responsible, they don't walk the dog. They don't do their chores. They don't do their homework, but they promise you with a PowerPoint presentation that if you give them a phone, you, they will listen to every rule that you do and they'll do like, you have to be like, no, you haven't proven that. So your child has to be proven responsible and it's okay to do those baby steps. Like don't start with a smartphone, start with a dumb phone, like a gab phone, G-A-B-B dot com gab phone. It's got like GPS and they can take pictures and they can listen to music, but it doesn't go online. So start with those kinds of steps and really mm -hmm. ask yourself, why do they need this uh, phone? And it's probably like, oh, just so that we can find you. Well, then you just need a dumb phone. You don't need a smartphone to be able to find someone. Right. You know, and realize that when Steve Jobs told all of us to get tablets and said that the, the iPad was the most amazing thing on the face of the earth, and he was right when he said this thing will change change everything. He was right about that. He did not yeah, oversell was. that. But when the New York Times reporter came to his house and asked him, oh, how do your kids like it? He said, oh, we don't have one. My kids don't have one. So as parents, as grandparents, we need to not be suckers and think like everyone else has them. So we need to really teach our kids and ourselves that being different is actually quite good. And it's getting easier to do that now because people are so unhealthy. So it's getting easier to have yeah. those conversations of like, we don't want you addicted to these things. We want you outside. And, and doing good now is so basic, like sleep all night, <laughs> exercise yeah. for one hour a day yes. and have two hours or less of digital candy. If you can just use that as a parameter, you know, they're doing a study of 10,000 kids and this is what they're finding is, is working. It's like, Okay, grandma could have told me that a long time ago. So for us parents to realize it's not that complicated. It is delaying addictive devices. It is making your environment so that they can't just grab them and use it themselves. Like they're, it's like it's hard to find. But instead, what's easy to find are board games and cardboard boxes to make forts and yeah. crayons and go outside and ride your bike and all those things. So I think that for parents, it's it's not that it's so complicated. It's pretty simple, but you just have to have the courage to do it differently than what you're seeing that the, of what the average person is doing. Absolutely. And don't use it for a babysitter. And don't use it for a babysitter. Have a yeah. purpose, you know, like we're going to yeah. watch, this is our favorite program and we're going to watch yeah. it, or this is something I really think you'd enjoy. Or we're going to watch it. And that's when really like going to the thrift store and grabbing a DVD player and DVDs is really nice because you know exactly what's being watched and it yeah. ends. It's over. It's unlike, you know, streaming service where it's just going to queue up the next episode and your <laughs> kids there for four hours, right. you know? So, yes. so it is really yes. helpful. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it too, as you were, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, we, we put the, a device like that in a child's hands and they don't have, they don't have maturity in the first no. place to handle it. And, and the dangers that can happen with that, you know, I've had so many parents that a child has been exposed to pornography at yeah. a really, really young age. And, and so, you know, if we, if we wrote all those things that can happen down, why would you give that to a child yeah. that you're trying to grow? And, and I'm not against, I mean, social media, all those kind of things are a lot of part of what we do with Austin Marriage. It's how we reach people. But there's danger. But it's with, with adults, too. right? It's, it's adults, adults who have fully yes. formed brains who can kind of yes. make decisions, whereas kids don't have that that ability no. to kind of regulate themselves. They don't know how to do it. Yeah. No, they don't. And, and you know, I, I, from a parent's standpoint, a grandparent's standpoint, I, I shouldn't expect them to. Yeah. Because that's expecting them to... Oh yeah, my kid's mature. You better be mature. You know, no, just right. you make those decisions for them. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Now I, I love that. And I love the, uh, the ages. And, and I think if we just get those in our mind and, and just stick with it, stick yeah. with it. I had a friend you know. who told me, you know, when her daughter was entering middle school, 
that the other mothers were saying, oh, well, you have to get your daughter a phone now because that's how she's going to get in contact with everyone. And here's the number of the therapist we all use because you're going to need this too. Right. That's okay. And so it's yeah. like, why? And she kind of looked at him like, I don't understand. Like, why would, why would you tell me this? Right. But that's yes. what we're up against as parents that we're told that this is very normal, like a rite of passage almost that a kid has to have this, but there needs to be a bit of rebellion in us to say, you know, I don't need my kids. Like we would never, uh, like, for instance, we say, uh, let's say 10%, statistically, 10% of kids will get addicted to video games. Like, so not will everyone turn into a gamer who stays home from right. college and can't get a job? No, but 10% of kids will. And you think about that yeah. in any other area of life, 10% of you in this airplane are going to get cancer or 10% of you using mm. this are going to get really ill. Like none of us would take those odds, 10%. So for parents no. to just be like, this, these odds are not good. We, we're not going to, we're not going to do this for we're our not kids. Gonna, I mean, yeah. you're rolling the dice with your kids yeah. and our kids are very precious to us. So yeah. yeah, you've, you've kind of talked a little bit, some of, of, especially we talked about your older daughter, but how have you seen, since you guys have done this over time, how have you seen this really help the family? Other things that yeah. you've seen? Oh my that, goodness. So I cannot even begin. It's like our family has, you know, like the, the sense when you walk into a house and that it's a place where people are, are warm and they're talking and it's fun and you're free and you can listen and you have the freedom. You can go up to your room and listen to music or, you know, you do it versus like a home where everybody's like either on their own devices or they're arguing, like, put this down, put this down. Put, you know, so we've had family dinners together. We do things together. So for instance, you know, we have three kids. So it's like they all played the piano and we all went to the same teacher. And then when it was time to do jujitsu okay. and karate, we all did it together. Even the parents, we all, now our thing is ultimate Frisbee. Every Sunday afternoon, we play ultimate Frisbee in the park. So we're used to like, oh, everyone goes hiking. Now everybody skis but me because I'm really lame at it. So that's where I have broken it. But <laughs> there's a lot of family activities. How can we do this? Because there's relationship, because the time hasn't been spent on social media and things like that. Yeah. So there's relationship there that exists. And then we have more time than most people, because if you're not spending eight hours a day on social media, you, you have some time on your hands and you get Absolutely. to find out like, oh, you have an art interest. You like to draw. You like to ride horses. You like to crochet. You like to 3D print Nerf guns. You know, I've named kind of all the you like to read. Like <laughs> these are the things our kids like to do. So you have time to to discover that. And then you have time to invest in that, like to go do those things together, learn those things together. So it's been you know, in terms of like from elementary school to the teenage years, it's we've really, really enjoyed it because that That's whole so tension good. of like, get off that. You know, what are you looking at? Pay, look me in the face when you talk to me, like all those things. They're not they're not part of our lives. And it yeah. really does make your life so much easier because you don't have this thing competing for your affection 24 hours mm. a day. And you're able to spend more time with your family. And honestly, like, you know, when my son went to college, he's at Cal Poly public school. It's like people will ask, well, did he go crazy? You know, now he's got a phone and it's like, <laughs> is he watching porn and like playing <clears throat> video games every night? Like, what's he doing? You know? And it's like, he's lived a certain way for 18 years. And then you give him the phone and it's kind of like, it just kind of is there, you know? And, okay, and yeah. he has made the choices himself to be like, I mean, I don't think... He, he watches YouTube, but he will put himself on a, like he watches sports. So after baseball sure. season, he'll say, I'm going to take a YouTube break for a week. Like he does it himself. Like he has, so it's really like your kids, it's not that they go so crazy after when they're given it, but you're giving them a better chance because they're able to develop other skills, other habits, mm -hmm. their taste for other things so that it's not the only thing they like is a video game. The only thing they like and can do is sit in their bed and do social media. That's what we're really trying to avoid, that that's the only place that our child feels comfortable because obviously that's a very limiting world. Well, and I think as he grew up and that he saw the value in it for yeah. him. It's more fun. And maybe, yeah. maybe everybody, every kid doesn't, but I think so. I think, and he was, he's mature now and he's able to make choices for himself and yeah. not, not fall into that. That's, mm -hmm. that's so good. You know, well, a couple of pieces fit together for me when you were saying some things, uh, my grandkids, I've said, they all live close. And so they spend a lot of time here and their friends spend a lot of time here and they're, my grandkids always say, my friends love to come to your oh. house. They love to come to your house. And I think it's, 
because we we talk to them and yes. we do stuff with them and we play games with them or we yep. go outside and do something with them. And I think some of them that's unique for them Yeah, because they may not get that at their home. And, and just, uh, I just brought to mind some of those kids that just love coming over here. Uh, you know, we've had some, one little boy said to him, I wish you were my granddad, you know, and I said, said, I wish I was too, you know, but but I think it's because, because of that and kids, they value that and they see the difference. They need the interaction ever bit, if not more than we do as adults. It's such a good word to remember like, oh, they, we think they don't want it, but they do. Like kids want to spend time with you. They want to do things offline with you. And, and they make, you may get a little pushback at first. Yeah. You know, I think the, the families who've taken their kids off for a month off of yeah. off of phones and stuff, you know, they got a little kickback early right. on because their kids had right. been used to it. But then it's got to like, I remember one lady said, you know, the month was up and she didn't ask me for the phone back. Yeah. She would just, she got it back, mm-hmm. but, but she didn't ask for it. And so yeah. I thought, well, that's just really cool. She, yes. She's learned some things in that time. It's so it's so just good. Really good. Yeah. Oh, this is so good. Final question. What are you loving about your marriage today? We've been married for 25 years now. And I think that it's, it's fun to enjoy our older kids together. So, you Mm. know, when you're in the little years, it's a lot of like, oh, do you have the sippy cup? Do you have this? It's like so a lot. It's very work intensive. But now that they're older, it's like we're enjoying them as as all, you know, like talking to them and finding out their opinions. It's very it's a little bit more relaxing that way, you know. So I think that's very sweet. And then even looking towards empty nest thinking towards like, what are things that we would like to enjoy doing together? Because, you know, during those active parenting years, it's very much a unit and a family. And so that has been fun to like, we picked up dancing. So neither of us are good at it naturally, but there's this (laughs) ballroom dancing kind of place and they learn, you know, salsa and foxtrot and swing and waltz, you know, things like that. Oh yeah. And it's super fun. So just trying to, to find new ways for us to connect without the kids, like thinking through those things, you know, and kind of rediscovering. So it's almost like, you know, you get this marriage 2.0 kind of deal. So that's been a lot of yeah. fun. Yeah. And I think you do. When the kids get to a certain age, my son and his wife are going through some of that. Now the kids are yeah. busy and, and all that stuff. So they're, he told me not too long. He said, yeah, we're, we're sometimes we're empty nest already right. with the activities yes. the kids have and stuff. And so, so yeah, I'm just looking forward to that and enjoying all those things. Yes. And it sounds like you've got a precious family. Yeah, they're, we've, we're very blessed. The Lord's been very kind and good to us. And, and you know, I'm part of National Marriage Week. And so at marriageweek.org, marriageweek.org, there are creative date ideas there. So that's a fun thing for people to look at yes. to see like, oh, what's something different that I could do on Friday night with my with my spouse? So that's at marriageweek.org. And National Marriage Week is is once a year, and it's always the week leading up to Valentine's Day. And it's just about like what we started talking about. How can we make marriage more attractive? to Absolutely. our children and to the next generation. Oh, that's that's great. Because I think sometimes couples say, well, we want to change or we want to date or something. Yeah. And yeah. so there's a resource there to go to that's and right. to help them. We'll put all that in the show notes so people have it. And in our email that goes out to the subscribers that where we take these conversations and we yeah. give them more questions to interact on themselves with that. This has been delightful, Arlene. The book the latest book is Screen Kids. Yep. And also right. Grandparenting Screen Kids. We have both. So if, whether you're grandparenting or you're parenting, those are good things for technology. And there's a book about technology for us as well. It's called Calm, Cool, and Connected, Five Digital Habits for a More Balanced Life. So if you find that you're the one, it's like, oh, my kids are okay. It's me. Then that might be a good one. <laughs> Calm, cool, and connected. Probably with most families, everybody's it's everybody in, that's in right it to some point yes. it is you it's know, true uh, and so we it's something i think we all have to stay on top of and stay connected with if they want to find you other places where that would that be yes you can do my name it's arlene com, and i have happy home podcast that drops every monday so it's the happy home happy home podcast You've got a great web page. I was on it looking at things yesterday. So I encourage people to go there. This has been a great conversation. Thank you for spending time and thank you for the research and things you've done to help us help people, help their kids and grandkids. And maybe we can get to that point where where we have a handle on this. That'd be really nice, wouldn't it? Yes, it sure would be. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. Thank you. Bye.